PLA is known as a kind of eco-friendly filament. But what if I told you there was a filament that was actually biodegradable, printed just like PLA, but in some aspects performed even better. Today we test it and find out if PHA is too good to be true. My patron Nova++ Plus Plus posted about a true biodegradable filament called PHA and that really piqued my interest. So I ordered some and here we are in the first of a two part series putting it to the test. The results were pretty interesting so strap yourself in and let's go. This video is about comparing PLA to PHA but before we do that let's discuss PLA a little bit more in detail. PLA stands for polylactic acid. And as we can see here on Wikipedia, it's the most popular bioplastic in the world. It's a bioplastic because it's made from fermented plant starch like corn. So it certainly ticks the box in that no crude oil is needed to produce it. The problems, however, come around its disposal. Previously, Angus from Maker's Muse make this video explaining how PLA doesn't break down how people might think. He explained that without industrial composting, it's likely to stick around for hundreds of years and suggested an alternative in cellulose that he was able to make a slurry with, but not able to melt and mold. Stefan from CNC Kitchen then went even further with his video, printing a range of different PLAs and then burying them in his regular backyard compost. After a few months, he dug them back up, retrieving the plastic and was able to demonstrate that without industrial composting techniques, there was very little breakdown. Furthermore, he then put them in his test rig and was able to demonstrate that they hadn't even really lost any strength. This included a sample from Colorfab, which had a PLA slash PHA blend, which brings us onto the filament for my video. The filament that we're testing is not a blend, but a straight PHA. So what does that actually mean? PHA stands for polyhydroxyalkanoates. This is another bioplastic, but interestingly, this one is synthesized in a lab as a byproduct of feeding microorganisms like bacteria. So in a way, this is the yield of microorganism farming. Let's look at the company's website to see about the disposal stage. We can see that filaments derived from petrochemicals have no biodegradability, and that as we know, PLA is compostable but only under certain industrial conditions. PHA, however, can be composted at home, as it can be broken down by microorganisms that are naturally present in the soil or compost. The exact filament I'm testing is BioPHA Generation 2, and if we head to the website, there's a range of technical specifications. For the temperature and fan, it's pretty much the same as PLA, but we'll note that a heated bed is not required at all, although glue on the bed is recommended. It also says that this filament absorbs a very low amount of moisture. And to back this up, we'll notice that the spool is just loose in the box without any sealed plastic packaging, something we're used to as a way to keep out moisture from every other filament type. Apart from that, and being marked as compostable, it pretty much looks like any other 3D printer filament. This spool appears mostly like a matte PLA. In this video, I'm comparing PHA to PLA because that's the filament I think it would replace. And my first question was, how many settings do I need to change to print it? We're going to start with a baseline PLA print on my second SK tank, and we're going to use the built-in to Orca Slicer, Orca Cube. I think this is an excellent test object. It's fairly small, doesn't take too long to print, doesn't use too much filament, has fine details, overhangs, and we can also test the accuracy of how the two halves fit together. And as you would hope, on a printer I've had for some time, with a well-established PLA profile, it completed successfully on the first go. And what we have here is a perfectly respectable print. The two halves screw together, which means the clearances are spot on, and all of the other details are there too. I probably need to up my flow rate just a little bit, but apart from that, she's pretty good. So what needs to change to print PHA? After loading the filament, I went back into Orca Slicer, opened up my PLA profile, and the only change I made was setting the bed temperature to zero. On this machine, I print PLA at 220, so I maintained that, hit slice, and sent it to the printer. This printer uses a smooth PEI sticker sheet for the bed, and I chose not to apply any glue stick or any other adhesive. And to my relief, as far as I could tell, the first layer was sticking just fine. Half an hour later, the Orca cube had completed without being knocked off, and I was able to pull off the two pieces from the bed just by yanking them off, rather than flexing the spring steel sheet to release them that way. Overall, it looks like it's meant to, but obviously all of the corners have a distinct problem. If you ever print with a new filament and it looks like this, 
The problem is that you haven't tuned Pressure Advance. So I went back into Orca Slicer and used the inbuilt Pressure Advance Tuning Tower. This is compatible with any firmware because the commands to change the value are baked right into the G-code. The tower completed successfully, albeit a little distorted, and we can see those corner artifacts that we saw in the cube replicated on here as the pressure advance value gets too high. So to fix this, all I had to do was find a suitable height where the corners were crisp, go to that same height in the Orca Slicer preview and retrieve the pressure advance value. I then made a copy of my PLA profile but for PHA, inserting the new value which for the record was about a quarter as much. Save the new profile, slice and send it to the machine. The reprint was looking good with the early layers being a little bit cleaner. Once again, the print completed on the first go, and again, I would say this print is respectable and at least as good as the PLA version. Clearances and accuracy were spot on, as we were able to screw in the plug on the underside of the cube without any dramas. Here's the two side by side, and it's really a game of spot the difference. The PHA print on the right probably even looks a little cleaner, because its colour is more consistent on all of the walls. And for both, the flow rate needs to increase, to close some of those gaps in the corners and in between extrusions. This was a very good start. Turn off the heated bed, one tuning towel for pressure advance, and the rest of the settings as is. So definitely convenient, but how did the properties actually compare? We start by comparing a pretty print, and by that I mean something less functional and more decorative, and I chose this great grumpy gargoyle by 3D Printy. As you might expect, the PLA version printed first go. But switching to PHA, I actually had an unusual failure, which at first looked like a clog. As you can see, this one was looking fine, but then just stopped extruding. It turns out there was some sort of blob that was jamming on the entry to my reverse Bowden tube. And once I removed it, the print completed successfully, and I didn't have any other failures of this kind. From here, it's really a case of spot the difference. PHA really is an excellent drop-in substitute for PLA for the majority of prints. With PLA, by increasing the temperature, we can get the surface to go from matte to glossy. To test if PHA was the same, I set up a temperature tower in Orca Slicer, 230 down to 190 degrees Celsius. When we look at the resulting print, we can see that bridging is pretty poor throughout, but in terms of that surface texture, a change in nozzle temperature doesn't really affect how the print looks. And I think most of the time that's a good thing, because the texture can change depending on the nozzle speed, so PHA looks a little more consistent. Let's do some simple relative strength testing with my open source hammer machine. As it swings down, it moves this ratcheted dial, so we can see the height to which the hammer swung. And what you see here is a free swinging baseline. And for this video, I created a simple test token, as well as an adapter for it to hold it in the vise. It's sized so that if you print it with four walls, that are set to have a 0.6mm width, and the wall generator set to classic, the section designed to break will be consistent regardless of infill. We can then print a set in each type of filament. Firstly, the PLA tokens which are loaded into the machine. We reset the dial back to the bottom, drop the hammer, and see how much lower the dial goes compared to free dropping the hammer. We repeat this for all of the samples and take the average. We then repeat this methodology using the PHA samples. Again, breaking five and taking the average. And here are my results. They're a little bit crude, but they are still valuable. Up the top, we have the free swinging baseline and then the range for the PLA samples. As you can see, the hammer swung almost as high, meaning the PLA was brittle and snapped fairly easily. The PHA, on the other hand, took a lot more energy out of the hammer, and therefore it didn't swing as high. So based on this test, for impact resistance at least, the PHA is superior. Let's examine a PHA test to see why. Unlike the more brittle PLA, the test sample only partially breaks. We can see for the PLA samples on the left, they almost always snap completely, but for the PHA on the right, we only get a partial failure in all but one case. Let's further compare with the raw section of each type of filament. For PLA, we can see that when we deform it, it pretty much stays deformed. But for PHA, we can apply the same load, but as soon as we take it away, it's more elastic and wants to return to its original position. Furthermore, for PLA, a few more back and forth motions causes it to fail completely, but for PHA, we can go back and forth multiple times and we just don't get the same result. My impression is that it's a lot more similar to PETG than PLA. Also remember that PLA tends to deteriorate in the atmosphere over time and becomes even more brittle. But PHA shouldn't really absorb any moisture and therefore will hopefully stay consistent. Here's a new test piece I designed just for this video. I printed one in each type of filament and each of them have a large heavy nut pressed into place. 
I can then flip them up and add further weight to the middle. From here, the cable tied onto a tray and inserted into an oven or dehydrator with a thermometer in position. What we're going to test here is thermal stability in a hot environment. This result surprised me a lot because as soon as we hit 70 degrees, the PLA failed and sagged, but the PHA didn't deviate. If we cut the tires and remove each sample, we can see that the PHA still springs back into position, whereas the PLA is quite plastic. It's a lot more pliable and springs back very little compared to the PHA. So while the two filaments have very similar printing temperatures, it seems that the PHA is a lot more resistant to high temperatures in its operating environment. So far the PHA had performed very favorably, but I did manage to find a chink in its armor. And this came with my final test print, this mini studio clamp by Vasishkin. What makes this print stand out compared to everything else is that it's got long solid structures, but the contact patch is very small that touches the bed. This is an ideal model to test if a filament warps. In the right circumstances, PLA can warp, but in this case, I had no such problems. The model was successful on the first attempt. BHA, however, decided that it was going to be up for a fight. You might think this was just knocked loose because of the small contact patch, but if we hold up a straight edge, we can see that the longest sections are nowhere near straight and they've warped quite a bit. My first change was heating the bed to 40 degrees to see if it made any difference, but unfortunately it did not. So I once again disabled the heated bed and sliced it this time with a brim. Again, things looked good at the start, but the end result was the same. At least this time, only half of the model had come loose. So I caved and followed the original instructions adding some dimifix to the surface as an adhesive. And this time, finally the print completed, albeit with one part lifting up. I need to be clear here, there's nothing wrong with the way this filament is sticking to the bed on the first layer. We can see this by how difficult the brim is to remove after the rest of the print is gone. What we're seeing here is purely warpage, just like you would find from something like ABS. Out of interest, I thought I would try a printer with an enclosure and switch to the Magneto X but across multiple bed types, I couldn't get the pressure advanced tower to stick. I tried an orca cube, but as you can see, it ended up being a hot mess. And if we put the straight edge on the bottom of the first layer, we can see that despite the enclosure, this filament has warped and come loose. On certain geometries, PLA can definitely warp, but based on my testing, PHA warps a lot more, to the point where it's a drawback that needs proper consideration. For most prints, it's probably fine, but the warping is a bit of a shame. Even so, I'd probably consider switching from PLA to PHA for most of my prints, apart from two questions. Firstly, so far I'm taking the biodegradable part at its word. In this video, I haven't tested this at all, but I would certainly like to for a follow-up video. I want a filament that's better for the environment, but I don't want it to fall apart during normal use. According to the website, PHA shouldn't really degrade unless it's exposed to a high bacterial load, like you'd find in soil or compost. They claim PHA is naturally hydrophobic, so I would hope it's fairly waterproof. And according to Wikipedia, PHA is UV stable, especially compared to PLA. So I'm going to print a range of samples and put them to the test long term. And the locations will scale from straightforward to spots that should see this filament biodegrade as advertised. I haven't decided what model, maybe something like a lattice cube. There's plenty of surface area to be exposed, and I can thread some wire through it for retrieval, like Stefan did. The final question I have is about availability. For most of the time I was making this video, the Beyond Plastic website was down, and I could only access relevant information by using the internet archive. I purchased my spool from West3D, and it was pretty cheap at just over 20 US dollars for a one kilogram roll. But as you can see, most colors are sold out. So I asked West3D, and they told me the filament was on clearance because Beyond Plastics had been liquidated, and they didn't expect to be able to sell more in future. But now all of a sudden, as I finish this video, the website has come back to life. Although I should point out, all of the filament is still listed as sold out. So why reinstate the website? I really don't know. I asked my filament sponsor, X3D, if they were willing to look into PHA filaments and stock them. They said they actually used to stock the pH blend from Colorfab in the past, but stopped doing so because it was expensive and unpopular, but they will look out for PHA filament in future. You've seen the first test, and now I have some questions for you. Firstly, would you be interested in PHA if it was affordable and readily available? And secondly, what exactly should I print to put in all of those locations to see how durable PHA is and whether it will actually biodegrade? Thank you to Nova Plus Plus for requesting the video. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, happy biodegradable 3D printing.
G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you wanna see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really wanna support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.